So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this uh, Friday lunchtime for me. And I, I know it's mid afternoon for you there, Roger. Roger, can you hear me okay? Hi, Jay, and good afternoon to the folks. Thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us today. Um, just the chat that you and I have had this morning as I'm looking forward to talking more with you uh, about your experiences as photojournalist in South Africa. Um, and you've only just got back from what I presume was uh, was an assignment or work over the last couple of days, I believe. Is that right? Yes, it was a it was a very cool job going up to to the Northern Cape, which is a very arid area to go and photograph the, the square kilometer array telescope that's being built up there. Excellent. Um, so just guys, as you can see on the screen here, I'll just, uh, and they're in the chat panel already. So you've got a link there for Roger's website and he has two Instagrams that you can follow him on there. And Roger, that's a, that's a blog about a personal project. Is that right? The, the private view one? Well, yeah. Um, yes. Well, I mean, that's, that's just a, that's a more conceptual project I've been working on, on and off for a couple of years. Um, yeah, just trying to approach the photography a little, a little bit differently to what I've, I usually have done. But I hadn't seen that prior to you sending me the links earlier, and I was fascinated by that as well. Well, I had a look, uh, just adding the links into into that. So we'll talk about that. I think we'll talk about your, your, your personal stuff um, uh, after we've talked about, obviously, the photojournalism there. Uh, guys, as I said, uh, any questions you have for Roger, please pop them through the question panel, uh, and I'll ask them where appropriate. The first thing that I'm going to ask you uh, to do for us, Roger, is actually just tell us a little bit about um, you know, your your journey into photojournalism, where it kind of came from. Um, Jay, basically, um, yeah, I grew up in South Africa and during, during apartheid and um, sort of growing up, there was this sort of, as I got older, there was this sort of, this, this nagging, this, I don't know, just this nagging feeling that that something was not right and what the way I grew up and what I was told was just it was not right and um, yeah and then probably in my in my early 20s um, I made friends made friends with this guy Sam and he and I started walking around Alexandra Township um, which is just which is in Johannesburg and taking photographs and so and basically sort of for me to that was, I kind of left white apartheid suburbia, kind of more or less, well, before then, kind of believing what I'd been told. Um, but once I'd sort of, as it were, I sort of, you know, stepped through the curtain or down the rabbit hole, uh, suddenly I could see that whatever I had been told was, was a lot of it was lies. Um, so, Sam was a, Oh, I'm losing. I'm losing you a little bit. Opened as well. Sorry, Roger. I lost you a little bit there. Sorry. All right. I, I'm just saying that um, probably in the in the sort of eighty nine, eighty eight. I I walked around Alexandra Township, and that was that was the that was the way I sort of was able to see the world that you know the apartheid government or media wouldn't show me. And the, um, but uh, your love for photography already existed. And uh, am I right in uh, remembering that you um, spent some time and were inspired by the photojournalist? Was it, was it Steve? Yes, um, I'd gotten to know through friends, I'd gotten to know Steve Hilton Barber and I was, I was watching what the work that he was doing. And, you know, and that was in the sort of late eighties, which was very much counter to the, mainstream apartheid media and the main, mainstream apartheid message and he was working with a collective called Afropix and I have to say that that became like I just that was when it went once I started to, once I started to learn or see that um, wanted to go hello Oh, I've lost. Are you still there? I, we lost you for a second. Something yes. seems to... We do have a delay between us, guys, so we are sorry. Hello? 
Hey, All right. It might be a bit noisier now, but um, it might, I think it'll be more steady. Brilliant. I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Sorry, we were talking about Steve. So, so really sort of spending a bit of time with Steve and seeing what he was doing and working in his dark room. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, literally and figuratively a, a new world was exposed to me. And this was a world I wanted to wanted to be part of. But this this world felt like a truth to me that was just in a way it was kind of absent maybe in the way in some ways that I'd grown up. At what point did you decide then that photojournalism was for you and you wanted to be part of telling this story going into what now in history obviously is is the end of apartheid and what followed? I guess early in 1990, um, I, I'd been working at a kind of a, a sort of a computer company, and basically at a certain point, a few months after Mandela was released, um, I resigned and yeah, just basically got in, got into my car and went and photographed the first thing, and just it didn't stop there. And I, basically on that day, I kind of left home and said, "Okay, today I'm a photographer." And, and at that time, what was the process as a you know as a as as getting into photojournalism? So, we obviously you were shooting, and how would you get in the images out there? Or did that was there a transition? Did you shoot for a while and then then get the images out there? Can you give us a bit of an insight into that? Yes, it, I mean it, it was exactly the latter. So I started shooting for a few months, and and I had then started making contact with with Afropix. Um, and yeah, I just slowly then started basically just submitting work to them, whatever I'd shot, I would, you know, go and take it through to them. And then, yeah, slowly got closer and then I, they started letting me use their darkroom and, um, and then they started sort of putting, putting some of the work out and, um, yeah. And slowly the, the, the relationship just got closer and closer until I kind of became a bit of a regular. And what was your experiences at that time? We're obviously, you know, documenting, you know, doc well, as you have done or in your time in South Africa, um, you know, documented, you know, such important points of history. How did that? How did that make you feel as a photographer? And did you, did you feel like you were you were, you um, did you know that you were photographing at a time something that would be so historical? Um, I, I certainly had a sense that, you know, the, that the whole, you know, the whole political landscape was changing fundamentally. So, yes, I, I did have some sense that, you know, that, um, I suppose in a way I was going to places where history was, was happening. Um, you know, obviously one only realized the sort of the enormity of it in, in retrospect. I, I focused on this image um, because obviously it's very, very uh, powerful. And so I wanted to ask you a question as a, as a person, other than a photographer, how did you find when, you, how, how did, how is it, how does it affect you when you were seeing these things and then obviously have and, and reporting them and documenting them? Uh, look, you know, at, at the time I, I was kind of, you know, at the time I was kind of in, in young man, idealist, you know, slightly fueled by adrenaline mode. Um, I have to say in, in later, in later years, the, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of pictures from that time that I just don't want to look at. I don't want to, and I can, you know, there, there are, there are images and there are things that I saw that will, you know, they were just, they're like little scars in my, you know, sort of mind somewhere that will never go away. And in retrospect, I'd probably, you know, be quite happy if they did go away. So, you know, at the time, at the time, it didn't really have so much of, of an effect, but later on it did. It felt like it caused, you know, I don't know, it, it, it caused some pain, maybe quite a bit at times. 
On a different note, though, I think that it's incredibly important because otherwise the world doesn't get to see these things, though, right? Yes, yes, I still think it's it's something, you know, it's a job that has to be done. Um, that the world is a better place for, for the work of, of, you know, journalists and photographers. It was something that I wanted to ask you, and I'm not sure if it comes into this part or a bit later when we're talking about your time, you know, through the key parts of uh, South Africa. But something that I picked up on in um, in the article that you wrote for us was um, it, it it became more dangerous. Is that right? Is that now, was that later on, or was it now that it was dangerous, or you felt it was dangerous? <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that's, you see, that's much, much later on. Okay. Um, that's, I would say that's for the last five or six, seven years. Um, you know, so, I mean, that's, that's really basically when a, when a lot of South Africans, um, are very, are very unhappy with it, with the government and with the way that things are being run, but, you know, they don't really have a, they don't really have a clear, there's no real clear way forward. Um, so then, yeah. So I mean, in the in the early '90s, in a funny in a funny way, the 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 role and the importance of the media was, I, I almost feels like it was, it was way better understood, because I mean, you know, to to quite a big extent, you know, the the, the media were were in quite an adversarial kind of position against the apartheid government very often. Um, not all the time, but um, so, so, I mean, very often, you know, the, in, in those times, the communities would protect journalists because they knew what they were doing. They had a, quite a strong idea of what they were doing there and it was important for them. That actually, you just prompted a question that, um, that I wanted to ask was um, how welcomed were you in, in, in this environment? But I think you just said that they, they did welcome you. Is that right? You know, yes, by and large. I mean, obviously, if you, you know, if you're photographing people kind of, um, you know, doing something illegal, then yeah, maybe then you're, you, you know, you were not quite so welcome. But I mean, in those times, um you know it was kind of at times generally dangerous there were bullets flying around but i have to say that i i didn't feel personally that people were out personally to get me whereas i feel now in the last five or six years it's working on the street as a photographer in south africa has become quite a lot more dangerous and and yet you still want to do it <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, aspects of it. I, I, I suppose. I mean, I, I f it feels to me now that the, you know, the, the great, the great story maybe now is climate change, and that's that's that 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 that's what draws me now. Um, you know, which is different to what it was thirty years ago. No, for sure. I, I picked up on that actually. Just uh, there was a bit in about climate in, in obviously in your article again, and uh, that was one of the things I was going to pick up on later. Um, obviously, this is this is an absolutely I, I, iconic image, and obviously, uh, I, I presume this is this is the beginning of the Mandela era that you were talking about earlier. Well, yes, this this was this was quite quite early on. I think this is nineteen ninety one. So I mean. You know, he'd already been released for for a, a year, year and a bit. Um, but what made this um, what made this meeting special is that. So up until then, I think it was like this is mid ninety one, sometime around there. But um, they'd been basically they'd been fighting between um, ANC or African National Congress. Um, Township residents and then in Carter Freedom Party hostel residents. Um, and well, we would learn later from the Truth Commission that they were being fueled, it was being fueled by the, the, the National Party government. And um, so what was what was amazing about this meeting after that time was to walk in there and see um, F.W. de Klerk, the then 
you know, the last apartheid president, Nelson Mandela, and then on Mandela's left was um, Mangasutu Botulezi, who is the head of the IFP. And to, yeah, just to see these three leaders together, I thought, wow, things are going to change. Um, this is amazing. Because up until then, the, the things had been very kind of adversarial between them and positively violent between their, their, their followers. Hello, Jay. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Sorry, Roger. There's me. I pressed the mute button by accident. Um, so I wanted to follow on from that. Obviously, such a strong, iconic image with with the the, the two that we have here. Obviously, this is the front page of uh, the article that you did for us. You know, um, I have to ask then, knowing I was speaking to you a little bit earlier, it, it is is the is the bottom image. Is it genuine, or is it um, is is that how 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 real is that, or is it is it that just for the cameras? You you were on the front line, so you'd know better than anyone. No, I mean it was it was genuine, and I, and I think, I mean you know this is just my own personal opinion, but that that really was that relationship between de Klerk and Mandela. Um, they did they fought like hell, but they also I think respected each other to some extent, um, and actually they were all. <laughs> They were by and large all on the same page, um, you know, so there was a there was a connection between the two of them, even though they were often at loggerheads. And I have to ask from a, from a photographer's point, uh, point of view, um, when you have two such strong images like that, do, do you, uh, never mind what you're recording, do you know when you're looking at, obviously in this case, I'm sure it was, you know, would have been film and you get the contact sheets back and you see these images, do you know in your heart that you've got something that is going to be out there? As a fellow journalist, you know, it's, you know, it's going to be seen, people are going to want these images. Um, I, I wouldn't say that sort of these two in particular, but I knew the fact that the three lead, leaders sitting there and actually um, for, for an indoor, for an indoor event, the, the lighting wasn't bad. Um, I knew it was important. I knew this is important. I think looking at and talking to you and getting to know you a little bit, and even in the short period, obviously you've been in a place that has so many, so many things going on that need to be report, you know, should be reported with such, you know, major ch big changes in history there. Do you, do you know, you, you obviously know that this, it, this is going to be remembered um, uh, and, and put out there. How, how much, how much does it get, how much do you feel um, I guess the word I'm looking for is is pride. I guess is is, is the word, in what you do, being able to share these iconic times as a photojournalist. Does that come into it at all? Um, yeah, I don't know about pride, but it, it you know, yes, I, I did understand that it was history happening, um, and it was thrilling. It was it was undoubtedly thrilling. Um, that I was here and I, I had some sense of some of these situations that, yes, this will, you know, kids will, kids will learn about this day in history books. And yes, it was, it was thrilling. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, I, to be honest, this was an image that I wanted you to explain to me because it's something that I saw, but I didn't read it in context with the article. So I wondered what, uh, what, what it was and what it meant to you. Okay, so I, I suppose this is the other end of the parentheses. Um, this is a picture I took a couple of months ago at um, at an outdoor drive-in movie because of it was happening on a field because of of COVID. Um, and yeah, I just this is I suppose this is this is this is the other end of of the work that I've done. Um, this is from a few months ago, and I just, yeah, I just liked it. Um, no, it's brilliant. And I think it was interesting for me um, uh, learning about you um, was that 
um, what we, we haven't got examples of, I don't think, unless or we might have actually in the article. But the other thing that um, that you got inspired with and took some time to do was landscape. But I also felt that reading your words, that um, landscape was not even the landscape of your environment was important to you to, to capture in your photography. Um, uh, did I hit that right for you? Uh, yes, very much so. I think, I mean, even when I started dabbling with photography before, um, you know, much earlier on, even as a kind of a late teenager, the, 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 the landscape was important. The landscape, um, I don't know, it was the, if, if not the most important thing was at least the, the theater in which the play was happening and, and, you know, and, and kind of critical to, to what was happening. In a, in a way, visually, I could, you couldn't separate the two. I definitely got that. Uh, well, I mean, I think uh, it, it, just by stealing this page from the article, I mean, you know, you've you've, you've got two very completely different contrasting images there. But and you can see land. You can you can t interpret landscape in both of those. I think, can't you? Uh, as in time. Uh, but I also think that um, it's uh, and I I think we've got. I th um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Roger, as we go through these images um, that sort of show you. Uh, I don't, well, maybe we should uh, jump into at the end, jump into the blog to show some of those animal images because I think they're striking as well. Um, I love this, and this is why I wanted, I decided to put the, the magazine spreads is that I was maybe a typical young man fueled by almost religious zeal to shoot everything in front of me. Was that the beginning of the photojournalism journey? That's that statement there. Yeah, that, well, that certainly captured the, you know, my my approach and my energy and the, um, you know, I've been I've been scanning some of those pictures now, and I, I and I think in it was in October of nineteen ninety. You know, I, I think I shot I shot twenty six days in the in the in the month of October. So it's just every day was just out shooting, out getting out there. Um, so yes, I was, I was, I sort of, yeah, I was very motivated to to go and, and cover what was happening. So in the in the early days, going if we, if we do step back again with with the photojournalism, as you said, that you went out there, you decided to take that journey, you decided to document what was going on um, financially, because I, I want to pick up on that again a bit later in one of the points that I wrote down. That's all on you at the beginning, I guess. The you know the expense, the travel, the the, the film, the processing. Um, <laughs> no, no. I mean, certainly in the first sort of six months. No, my mum helped me a lot. Okay, um, family. Got no, I mean, there was no like for six months there was no money coming in. Yeah. Um, you know, and then eventually it it kind of you know I was able to start making a living out of it. But um, no, I've got to thank my mum for that. Do you think in, um, because we're going to touch on the changes of photography uh, over the years as well, but do you think that's uh, come a bit full circle again now with photojournalism, uh, Roger? Because obviously there's, you know, lots of people just stealing, not stealing images, but agencies aren't, you know, you're submitting for pennies. Do you think there's an element now of you've got to get in the mix, get the image? Um, you know, is it, is it as, I think you've already said that it is as hard as ever um you know to be a photojournalism a photojournalist is that right um uh, it's no no it's 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 much harder it's you know I'll, I'll 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 give you an example um um i have a friend who started working at one of the the big afrikaans newspaper um probably about 25 years ago um and at that stage, the this newspaper, Die Burger, I think, employed eleven photographers, um, and they now employ one photographer. So, no, um, no, no, it's it's much harder. It, I mean, it's financially just, you know, then this kind of the rope is just getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Do, um, so, do you think, to some extent, eventually? it will be you know people will just be grabbing what they can from 
people that images that people have shot on their phones and social media and and it's going to be it's it, can you ever see it being well it's can you only see it getting harder again do you, do you see it changing in any way um you know for the most part yes i'm afraid that it does feel you know it's kind of all um kind of bad news or downhill um but i think that there will be um will be exceptions of of quality information um you know but but the but the idea of it employing the numbers of people that it employed 20 years ago no not remotely yeah. um you know so a lot of the a lot of the pictures and, and a lot of the basically phones are going to be the sort of the main tool of journalism um so yeah I wanted to pick up on a few of the images that were, were featured in the article and just wondered if you wanted to give, there's a few in a row here, just wondered if you wanted to give us your insights into them, obviously, uh, and what they were about. All right, the one, the one on the screen now is is one of, um, well, it's a self-portrait, but that's from one of, was from my first kind of biggish conceptual project, um, which is called Wading, and that was, that was just basically walking around in the twilight um, of a small kind of fishing village, um, basically trying to capture, I don't know, atmosphere or emotions, um, not really focusing, focused on kind of capturing any particular facts. When, would it be in a personal, like you said, a, a personal project? Uh, and with obviously the photojournalism can be sometimes, as we've already said, you know, quite hard to do. Is it important to break up what you do with with your ideas to to do your personal projects to take yourself away from the documentary, the documenting of, of what's going on around you? Absolutely. Um, no, I mean the the you know. When I when I looked back, kind of years later, this this doing wading, which I did for kind of on and off for about two years, um, it was like throwing compost or fertilizer on my other photo other photography. My other photography just grew in leaps and bounds and moved. Um, so, kind of having another visual space to kind of go and play in was. It was very, very good for my professional and photojournalist work. We often get in all the different, you know, guest speakers like yourself in in all the different areas of of photography that we've featured on these on these guest uh, guest sessions. That that always has been the message that you know you just to, to keep shooting for yourself. It isn't just about what you do for the job. So I guess that definitely highlights what you're talking there. Always honing your skills, looking, honing your skills, I should say, or it, we're always learning, we're always looking at different things. And I, I think that's quite important. It seems important to you as well, Roger. Yes, because I think, I mean, it, it, you know, maybe you push yourself. So I, I shot that picture on film, but oh, you push sorry. yourself in all kinds of ways. Um, you push yourself to, to, kind of um, deconstruct your image what is the image you're after what is you know what are you doing here um especially doing these long projects you do actually do have space to kind of um to think and ruminate a bit in quite a positive way so this this um struck home with me ever since i saw it so is this a capture or was there some was a story to it um so yeah th this was in a in a refugee camp in Chad on the on the Sudanese border um, during a time when um, parts of the Sudanese um, population especially on the on the western side in Darfur were being um, I don't know they were being tormented and um, and and kind of killed by um, yeah, by groups uh, like they're called the Janja Weed, but they kind of had a lot of support from the main Sudanese government, from Al Bashir's government. So lots of people um, ran, basically left their homes and crossed the border into Chad. 
and this was a picture of a child just in the yeah in one section of the of the one of the refugee camps. Did it, it was it was it did it catch so what I guess what I want to want to lead on with did it just cat was the image just did it catch your eye because you you were you've honed your skills to look for these things or was it a case of that you were walk, walking around and you might have passed it a few times did she notice you I guess that that's what I was leading at um, look I have to say that you know that um, yeah I mean the, the whole you know a lot of it was very powerful for me um and in that particular shoot which was a couple of weeks well i mean the whole thing was a couple of weeks um i suppose that the the color became the, for me the color became very important um so i don't know how exactly i was thinking in that moment i, I don't really remember um but i i did have a sense that um while I was taking the picture that it was this is quite uh, this uh, this for me captured it captured it or captured yeah. some of it yeah it really it really struck on with me when I saw it brilliant um we, I touched we, we got to it a little bit early just now when I brought it up um uh, and another thing that I wanted well this is where I was talking about safety I guess and you and I and you we mentioned obviously it was a bit later as as in now um and you were saying that it's it's now more dangerous before we get on to that then what I wanted to ask you, and I know we, we've we talked about it this morning. Um, obviously, you've gone through the transition of you know film to digital. Um, how how has that impacted? Or how not impacted, but how has that changed you? And how do you think it's changed photojournalism? Um, okay. Well, first for me, it was. Um, so I I quite enjoy I still do I quite enjoy black and white and I enjoyed I enjoyed printing um, I enjoyed working in the dark room and it you know it gave me a lot of it gave me a lot of sort of satisfaction and pleasure to produce you know to produce prints to produce good prints um, so so basically when that world sort of started sort of turning towards digital. Uh, you know, at first we thought, oh, this is, you know, this is so convenient and it's so easy and quick. But, um, but it's, it's not really, it is not really the case. Uh, because what happens is that you shoot three or four times the number of pictures. So you, you spend considerable amount of time editing, just going through lots and lots and lots of pictures. Um, and yeah, so I, I guess in I guess in a way I felt a bit sort of shortchanged. Like you know, as I, as I said in the article, it's, it's not really what I signed up for as a photographer to spend most of my life in front of a computer. Um, and but then and and as far as photojournalism in generally, it had a it had a giant effect because you know even you know you had these like really hard-nosed business people like Rupert Murdoch owning newspapers and I don't really I don't remember the exact sort of timelines but whenever the the internet started really picking up and going they all thought oh we must put content we must put content on on the internet you know and even for sort of such kind of avid capitalists as them it, it it didn't occur to them that kind of giving people stuff for free would destroy the business and which it did i i think by and large i think it's it's you know it's fair to say that you know that a lot of a lot of i mean a lot of journalism kind of shrunk in that in that move from from paper based to to internet based you know, so it was. I think it was. It was generally bad news for the um, journalism world. I'm sure, uh, and, and obviously, I'm sure, I'm sure it's the same same for you there, Roger. We 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 have somebody we work with who who is a sport uh, a sports photographer, uh, um, and he was saying uh, we was asked a similar question, uh, and he's gone through the years like you from film to digital. And he was saying it was actually what the hardest thing that he found was that you know there might be ten you know, sports photographers at a football match, they've all got the, the image that the papers want and it was all about time. It took the whole thing out of it really. It was about getting it uploaded to a 
to the picture desks as quick and it was the first person who got there got the sale uh, is that is that very similar over there do you experience the same sort of thing now well I, I, that that sounds like a kind of an earlier version because i mean nowadays they just aren't there there are fewer and fewer photographers um you know so i mean i'm fortunate still to do work for for one of the wires for afp and you know there are a few freelancers but basically there's certainly in south africa there, there's so little freelance space that there aren't a lot of photographers out there usually the guys who are out there have got jobs or they've got some sort of you know they've their, their days being paid for um but yes sort of speed and delivery at that yeah that does make a difference um, I've I've kept on this because of because of the statement they're saying that it's become more dangerous. We've had a couple of questions that um, that about safety uh, as a photojournalism. Let me just read it uh, to you uh, to you, Roger. So um, clearly, obviously, we've seen that you've you've been working in some dangerous situations, but and it has a surprise to me, to be honest, saying that it, it's been more dangerous over the last few years. But just talking to you today, I understand why. As uh, as um, a photojournalist, then in these in these situations, do you find that do, is it? Do you like minimise your profile? Um, how how do you sort of how do you uh, refrain from the unwanted sort of attention? Is there ways around it when you record an event? Um, you know, yes. I mean, when I say it was, it's more dangerous on a on a you know on a on a kind of a day-to-day -day thing. Obviously, during the early 90s, there was hectic violence, which was, it was dangerous. Um, but working in the, in working like in, in, a, in a normal scenario was way safer then than it is now. But, um, you know, yes, as far as your profile, I mean, this, this is a terrible thing to admit, but, you know, up until, probably up until, I mean, I got robbed about three years ago. At gunpoint, and and up until then, I, I have to say, I've always ha I kind of had this pride that I kind of I kind of went anywhere, and after that, not so much. Now, you know, if I'm in a slightly risky area, no, unfortunately, it 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 impacts on the on the photojournalism. But um, yeah, in a risky area, I'll get out of the car, shoot a few pictures, but the doors open, the car's running. Um, Whereas in earlier years, I'd have gotten out of the car and gone wandered around. Um, and what's what I find, what I also find now, which is amazing, it, it's kind of heartwarming in a way, is that I quite often, I get out of the car and someone will come up to me and say, Boti, you must, it's not safe for you here. You must go. No, that's good. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, we were just in, in, in a bit of a similar um, reflection on Wednesday. I think I told you we were joined by um, uh, Mike uh, Goldwater, who's also a photojournalist, uh, uh, pretty much semi-retired now. Um, but he'd, uh, I, he did a uh, he, one of the things that we talked about was a feature that he did on um, Indonesian pirates, um, and um, he had. Uh, when I when I looked at it, I was like, uh, but then I obviously it, it transpired that the article had been arranged with a reporter just to, to a couple of spend a couple of days with the with these these pirates. Um, and, but I asked him how how safe he was, and he said, well, in advance, you know, you're meeting with them, and you have a an in between, uh, you know, like a, a go to uh, a finder, somebody that they know that they trust, they're talking to. You. Is that similar in these circumstances for for you, Roger? Um, yes, well, in some, I mean, for instance, I, I haven't done a, so here in the Western Cape, um, there's a long history of very organized and very violent kind of gangs. And, um, you know, so I haven't done a lot of work in the gangs, but that the, the, the way that I have gotten some access was exactly that way it was to find somebody who could act as an intermediary and kind of explain what they were doing. Kind of keep an eye on us as well um so yeah um as far as sort of doing the sort of gang gang stuff that's yeah that's the that's how i've been able to get a little bit of access 
And are you um are you wearing any uh obviously not obvious, but are you wearing any kind of protective clothing at all? Um, I mean I mean the sort of for kind of protests, especially ones that are going to be violent, yes, we kind of wear kind of like a skateboard helmet. Um and a couple of times where we've done things like ride alongs with the cops or um yeah, you know, once or twice, you know, then you, you know, we, we wear a, a flak jacket where there might, the chance, you know, there might be bullets flying around, but, but, if, you know, um, but mostly, our, you know, mostly the working photographers, the problem is just, it's flying rocks. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I knew we'd get these questions and I was going to ask them anyway, but we've got them uh, from, from the audience, Roger. So obviously, as you said, sometimes it's, you know, it's a bit gorilla as in, you know, you're jumping out of the car or, or you know, in these environments. So how much kit are you actually carrying with you? Is it, is it just the one camera now? Is it a couple of cameras and do you have go-to lenses? Let's have a quick chat about that. You know, if I, if I have a very strong feeling that it's kind of really high risk, you know, which I've done once or twice, then I'll, I'll prop, I'll take, you know, I might take a, one one older camera and a 24 to 70 zoom and you know or sometimes i'll leave i'll leave some stuff in the car and just take you know one camera and that that particular zoom um but generally no i mean you know generally generally with two cameras one with a longer zoom one with a i i mean i i've got you know and the, yeah, I mean, I, I, the, on the wider side, I prefer shooting with the primes. So I've got a 28 and a 50. Um, have, has uh, mirrorless changed the game for you at all, or was not something you've looked at yet? Uh, not yet, but it's going to. It's not far off. Yeah, it's definitely, we're seeing a lot more of it here, even in the portrait elements. But um, I just wondered on the size of things as well, would that make a difference and be a little bit easier to carry around? I I know some documentary wedding photographers who adopted mirrorless very quickly um, because they, you know, it was lighter and smaller and, and quicker to run around, those sort of things. Well, I, th I think that, you know, the future is fairly obviously mirrorless. Um, so, I mean, I haven't really used one, but, you know, I mean, I played a little bit with, a, with one of the Nikon's um and i found the i found the fact that the the fast 28 to 70 is is exactly the same weight so actually you're going to end up with this lighter camera with a much heavier lens it didn't really feel that you know didn't didn't really feel very well balanced but anyway that's i'm sure they'll they'll sort that out um, so I've got a couple more images that I took from the article that I'd like you just to sort of share your insights on. So we've got this uh, this shot of the two horses here. So is this from uh, something specific or another personal project? Yeah. So this was the, the this is from a second personal project, um, which is looking at animals, trying to uh, trying to photograph animals in a way so that 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 evokes other feelings that other but. Um, yeah, um, somehow sort of emotionally takes you to a different space. And so this, the animal project, I did shoot on digital. And um, yeah, still, I still have a plan to to print it, maybe using one of the, the old techniques. Uh, and this, is this from the, the project that the blog post is about? Yes, that's right. Perfect. Um, right, I've got this. Uh, I wanted you to give us an insight into this one for us. So th this is this is a photograph of of Archbishop Tutu during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, and yeah, if, if I may, I, I, kind of a story about a story about the. The Truth Commission, which kind of I think will kind of maybe explain this picture. Yeah, of course, go for it. So we, all of the journalists who are going to cover it, um, we we attended a briefing, and on on a notice board, it was it was the, the briefing we went to was at this nurses' college, which is where the Western first Western Cape hearings would be. There was a there was something written on a 
on a chalkboard saying that you know if there were journalists who wanted kind of emotional or psychological support that that this was available and it was you know you could go to such and such a place um you know and we kind of made light of it and we kind of said oh this is this is kind of funny you know kind of you know, typical sort of tough guy stuff um and I then photographed it for the next two weeks. And I have to say, I was, after two weeks, I was, I was emotionally shredded, I was absolutely shredded. Um, I had a very big, I had a very nice assignment actually from, from Stern magazine. And I actually thought I can't do another week of this. Um, so, and basically because of the, the, the testimonies, the testimonies are incredibly, sad and tragic and horrific and you know and then you know the fact that you you it's somebody's you know it's either the person themselves talking about their experiences or or it's a mother talking about her son um you know um or a husband talking about a wife it yeah somehow emotionally it just it was it, it was incredibly hard and i think i mean it was you know obviously it was it was incredibly hard for the for the commissioners so this is a moment where you know i think um the archbishop was just he was quite overcome i got that impression before you told me the story and now you've told me the story you know you you even you, even a simple uh you, your picture there you you could see something was up but now you've shared the story it makes absolutely uh so much uh so much sense um lots of, and praise for this praise for your shots in general but praise for this one coming through the chat panel there um on that one so another a familiar face uh we've got we've got here roger oh yes <laughs> um yeah this was just i kind of i heard quite by chance that um that he was going to he was going to be speaking at a giving out some prizes and, and, um, and, and speaking, well, I mean, giving a presentation and so, yeah, I just, I was, you know, I quite, I, I like to read a, a little bit of science and I had, I'm afraid to say, I never, I never finished, I never finished the, the brief history of time, but, um, but yeah, I was a bit of a fanboy and, yeah, I was kind of, and they, they walked from the one venue to another and I was trying to think, well, how can I, how can I kind of capture some of this? And then, I don't know, just using the, as, as they wheeled Professor Hawking um, into the one building, I just, I thought maybe a slow, slow shutter speed and a bit of flash could, could be quite fun. Um, Oh, it's, it's really strong. I really, I really liked it when I saw it. I thought, well, I need to know why, why you did it uh, uh, on that, and that's why I, I, I again stole it from the articles. I thought, right, because it, it wasn't, you know, these there's some we can only get so much in the articles, and that I wanted to know the story behind the image. Um, before we we finish off with the rest of the questions, uh, there, Roger, I wanted to actually take the last statement from the final page, uh, but I loved this statement of yours, which actually fin finishes your article. Um, and, and I, I, I thought that was a, it would be a great, you know, great way to finish off our, our chat today. Uh, but, but uh, you know, well, <laughs> do you want to just shed, shed your feelings on that if you, if you can? I think it, it speaks for itself, really. <laughs> well, I, maybe in another way, I, and it's I've done it now a couple of times. Sort of, you know, young people saying they want to. Um, Kind of come up to me and they you know they're saying somewhere or another or their father comes along and says no they want to be a journalist they want to be a photographer um and i'm afraid to say the last few years i've been telling them you know unless you have wealthy parents or a wealthy husband or wife um you know it's yeah it's a very difficult place to make a to make a, a living and it's a generally a difficult place um but what i suppose i don't tell them is actually then a small, a small number of people will do it and they will succeed and they will being, you know, it is, it's, it's, it's an amazing job. I have to say, 
you know, aside from making a living, it's a remarkable, it's a remarkable job. So, you know, so if those kids actually ignore my advice and still go and do it, they, they might be tough and have enough perseverance to actually succeed. Um, but, but yeah, it's not, especially, yeah, it's, it's not, <laughs> it's not a job for the faint hearted in many, many ways. It was, uh, I didn't, I, I've skipped it and I, I'm going to go back and ask you this question in a second. Um, but here finishing off, as we said about the article and, and your advice was to understand finance, which I thought was, you know, brilliant. I mean, um, you know, me, uh, not, not a photography student, but a, I was a film and television student back in the day. And I, you know, I had these illusions that, you know, you were going to just walk into this industry and it wasn't that at all. And if I'd known what I did then, I probably, I don't know whether I would have done something different. Maybe I would have looked to, you know, to, you know, to try and get an apprenticeship or work for free or get myself in there rather than thinking that I'm going to, you know, finish as a student and walk into these things. Um, so I thought that was great when I, when I reread that this morning uh, about the advice on uh, uh, finances. Um, I remember in the article, and I think you picked up on a few points, best advice that you'd been given. Can you remember some of those, those Roger? Um, a, a few bits. Um, I remember Steve once really kind of, um, really scold, giving me a long scolding about, I'd, I'd walked around this one area of the city photographing vagrants and and me and Steve gave me this really big scolding about, um, about the power dynamic between the person being photographed and the person taking the photographs. And, you know, he said, you know, this is just typical kind of old white South African bullshit power dynamics. Um, and that I mustn't show him pictures like that, which was quite, was a bit intimidating. Um, I mean, I also, I also spent a year studying with Obi Oberolzer, who's, who, who's, landscapes are his big thing and um and for him yeah it was it was moving it was moving around it was um but a sort of typical fray was it sort of you know he would look at a picture and said um you didn't really move much did you so you know and then he would say well i suppose i should be grateful at least you you pulled down the fucking window of the car so <laughs> Yeah, and that was, I don't know, that, those, are, those are, so yeah, those are two things that come to mind. Brilliant. The, um, uh, the, the landscape that, the, that you had from, uh, from Obi, as you said, our, we have a, a resident landscape uh, photography teacher based here in Wales with us, uh, Nigel, and the best, I remember the first, I'm, I'm a keen landscape photographer, but I remember the first day I spent with him, um, you know, he said, Jay, you, you haven't looked behind you once. You've only looked ahead, you know, and he said, uh, so he emulated exactly what you've just been said. Look all around you um, and don't get transfixed on the, on the one shot because you could miss uh, the real shot. So, so brilliant. Um, Roger, uh, we've, I've asked you the questions as we've gone, uh, but there's loads of praise already coming through uh, the, 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 the chat panel. Um, I just want to thank you for your time. So obviously, I know there's not a massive time difference uh, between us, which is which is great uh, on that. So thank you for giving it up. I know you've literally just come off the road, you know, from a job. So to, for me to spring this on you, and obviously, and the first time we've chatted is this morning, but um, I've loved spending this hour with you. So thank you so much, as well as the people that are putting it through the chat panel now, thanking you as well for your time. No, that's, that's a great pleasure. And thanks for making it fun. Oh, good. I'm glad, I'm glad on that. Um, as we said, we've shared uh, Roger's links with you in the chat panel. Do you have his website there, his two Instagram uh, uh, channels and uh, and the animal voice, which we didn't get to, but we had a little, uh, but I'd go and have a look at it, guys. I had a look at this one. It's fantastic. And there's a, a, a piece on there on, on what it's all about for it as well. And remember, the links will come out to you as well, uh, both um, via uh, the email that you'll follow up email that you get tomorrow and you'll be able to find them. Um, and don't forget the article. So I've only touched on a few things. There's more information from uh, Roger in the article he did for us. So it's two issues ago. So issue 46, 
uh, you'll find it, guys. And again, as I said, all the magazines are available for you uh, to download.